Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'll get us started here. Um, so um, my name is Paige. I'm going to be giving a good portion of the webinar, um, and I'll introduce everybody else later. Um, so this on this um, opening slide, um, we just have some of our upcoming webinars that we will share um, later as well. Okay, let's get going here. So um, the people that are going to be talking at you today are me. So my name is Paige Wittick, and I'm the education coordinator with the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Um, Zeb and Dana and Ethan are also going to be talking to you guys a little bit about some of their favorite backyard birds. Um, Zeb is our conservation science communicator, and Dana and Ethan are our co-directors and co-founders of the organization. So um, we've got some great information for you guys. Um, we're hoping this will be about an hour, um, and yeah, we'll, we're, let's get moving. <laughs> so um, just a little bit of information about our organization. So this is our mission statement, and essentially what this means is that we work to help birds, and we do that in a couple different ways. So our work, we work towards providing quality habitats, um, sustainable agriculture, which is what feeding the flock refers to, providing bird-friendly communities. And what we're doing today is um, encouraging people to get out in nature um, and learn more about it and experience it for themselves. So um, if you have any more, if you wanna know more about our organization and what each of those things really refers to, you feel free to visit our website at mrbo.org. So today, what we're talking about today is birding or bird watching. Um, which is a really fun and healthy activity that you can do with the whole family. Um, it also can be a great way if you need some alone time, say your sibling is really bugging you today, um, it can be a great way to get outside and um, look at some birds and enjoy nature. So what we wanna do today is give you guys some of the tools um, to learn some of your backyard birds, um, some of the most common ones that you might find there and give you guys some resources to, um, how to attract them to your yard, as well as learn how to identify them. So um, the outline, so what the webinar is gonna look like. So um, I'm gonna give a little bit of introduction why we think birds are super awesome. Um, we'll give you guys some examples of some common backyard birds that are our favorites. Um, I'll go over how to make some bird feeders just from stuff around your house. We'll go over some other ways to attract birds. And then I'll share with you guys a way to access some resources if you're looking for activities um, to do with your family and at home that can um, be really um, fun and help you explore nature. I'll also be taking questions throughout. So if you have a question, feel free to put it in that Q&A box that Dana and I talked about. Um, it's uh, like if you move your mouse, it'll be at the top or bottom of your screen. You just click that, a window will open and you can type your question in there. Um, otherwise, there should be questions or time for questions at the end. So it's going to be a great webinar. So to start off, let's talk about birds. So why help birds? Well, one really cool thing about birds is that they're everywhere. Um, from the most natural landscapes that you can think of to very urban areas all over the world. And because they occupy so many different spaces, um, they connect us and so they travel, they migrate over thousands of miles. They connect us to people that are very far away. Um, just this morning, I had a hummingbird at my feeder for the first time this year and it was down in Central America and came back up. So that's a connection between these two areas that are very far away. And what's really cool about helping birds is because they occupy so many different areas and so many different habitats, when you protect birds, you also protect a wide variety of different plants and animal species, as well as some of the habitats that we rely on as well. So in short, why help birds? Birds are awesome. Um, and we're gonna give you guys some examples. We're gonna go over some common backyard birds um, that we think are awesome, and hopefully you will agree. Um, and these are by no means like all the birds that you might find in your backyard, but it's a pretty good sample of some of the most common ones. So let's get started with that because that's really fun. <laughs> so um, if you guys have ever seen this before, or maybe you've heard this guy before, if you know what this bird is called, why don't you go ahead and click that raise your hand button, which you, I think you can find at that same window where that Q&A button is. <laughs> 
Yep, I see a lot of raised hands. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, if you're familiar with this bird, this bird is called a blue jay. Ooh. <laughs> um, so so called, yes, because it's blue, and also the call it makes kind of sounds like it's going J, J, J. And here's what that sounds like. Can everybody hear? So maybe you haven't seen this guy before, but you've probably heard that when you've been outside before. And it's very rare that it's just one. Um, and Blue Jays aren't known for being quiet. <laughs> Um, so a big key with identifying this guy is a lot of people see that blue color and they really focus on that and they think blue bird equals blue jay. But that's not necessarily true. We have a lot of other different blue birds um, here in Missouri and in, in the eastern U.S. So we've got our eastern bluebird, we've got an indigo bunting, um, a blue grosbeak, and a blue gray gnatcatcher. And these birds, you look at them and you're like, well, Paige, of course, that's not a blue jay, but they are also blue in color. So there are obviously other um, factors about the blue jay that you can use to identify it. So an important thing to look at um, is kind of the overall shape of a bird. And a blue jay has a pretty distinct overall shape. It's got that crest on the top. Um, let's see if I can get you. It's got that crest on the top. It's got this little black necklace here, and it's got a lot of patterns on the bottom of its wing and its tail, and it's got this kind of longer, thinner beak as compared to like a cardinal. Also, when it's flying overhead, you can kind of see this little like diamond tail shape. That's pretty distinct for a blue jay for you to be able to tell, even when it's flying over. Also, they like to call when they fly over places, so that can be a big clue too. Um, one fun fact about blue jays <laughs> is that they mimic the calls of other birds. Um, so they have a really wide um, vocal range, I guess you could say. And one bird that they really like to mimic is this bird here. This is called a red-shouldered hawk. Red-shouldered because it's got this kind of orangish shoulder to its wings here. And those guys sound like this. So a high pitched key, key. And it's not known for sure why blue jays mimic this red shouldered hawk call. Um, but one thing that I've noticed that some other people have noticed too is that blue jays will fly up to a feeder, make the red shouldered hawk call, all the other birds fly away from the feeder, and then the blue jay has got the feeder all to itself. <laughs> So these birds are very clever. Um, so you may have heard like um, crows and ravens have a high level of intelligence and have been known to solve intricate puzzles. The blue jay actually belongs to the same family as those guys. So they're all very smart birds. All right, is anybody familiar with this bird? You can go ahead and raise your hand if you are. Some people, maybe, maybe not. So yeah, so believe it or not, these pictures are actually of two different species of birds. Um, and we're lucky in Missouri to have both of them. So these are black-capped and Carolina chickadee. So the black-capped chickadee is this one here to the left, and the Carolina chickadee is the one here to the right. And you're not crazy, they do look crazy similar, um, but there are some clues um, that can tell you different ones. So they both have this black cap here, it's kind of white face, black throat, small thin beak and the main difference visually that people have seen but i think this is a pretty hard cue is this little bit of white here on the upper part of the wing the black cap has and the carolina doesn't but the best way to tell the difference between them is by their song so they have a little bit of different song so the carolina chickadee is going to sound like it kind of sounds like do 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 and so one way that I remember that, the mnemonic that I use is cheeseburger, or some people like, hey, sweetie. So here's what that guy sounds like. Yeah, so kind of that cheeseburger. Now the Carolina chickadee is a little bit higher pitched. 
Um, and this recording, I want you to pay attention to that beginning part because theirs is more of a four part call, kind of do, 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 do. Um, and so, um, and then you'll hear at the end of the recording some other calls that the chickadees make. Um, and these ones can be a bit more similar between species, but here's what the Carolina, Carolina chickadee. All right, so uh, I, I think I said that the first one was the Carolina. So the first one was the black cap, and then that was the Carolina. So the Carolina has that four part up, down, up, down, and the black cap chickadee has the cheeseburger, um, which I like using because I, like, I think it's funny thinking that Carolina chickadees or black cap chickadees are going around saying cheeseburger. <laughs> Um, but the really, so those different calls can be a factor to identify the difference of them, but the main way, um, to really the easier way to tell the difference is that they occupy different ranges. Okay, so yeah, so you got to hear the Carolina again. Um, so the main difference is that they occupy different parts of Missouri in different parts of the country. Um, so the Carolina chickadee occupies the southern part of Missouri and the black cap chickadee occupies more of the northern part of Missouri. Now you see there is some overlap. Um, if you live in that overlap region, it might be a good idea to learn these calls because you might hear both and that can be really cool. Um, I know I've heard here in Arrow Rock, I've heard both, um, both the Carolina and Black Cat Chickadee, so that's really fun. So the chickadee, you kind of heard at the end of the Carolina um, recording, they also make another call, and the reason they're called chickadees is because their alarm call somewhot sounds like they're going chickadee dee dee dee. So here's what that sounds like. This is their alarm call. So that's not the best recording of what it sounds like, but you can kind of hear that chickadee And what scientists have discovered by studying this call is that the number of Ds and how fast they say the Ds corresponds to the amount of danger nearby. So if you or I were walking in the forest and a chickadee saw us, they might be like chickadee like, hey guys, like there's a human over there, just FYI. However, if a predator like a hawk or something might come by, they're going to be able, feel a lot more threatened. And so it might be more like chickadee dee dee dee, chickadee dee dee dee. Um, and what's also really cool is other birds besides chickadees can tune into this alarm call and be warned um, by with the chickadees call. So a lot of other species of birds like hanging around chickadees and that's one of the reasons. Another reason other species like hanging around chickadees is because they're really good at finding food. Um, and so the, we have a lot of migrants that are about to come through um, this area. And if you're new to town, who are you gonna go to? You're gonna go to the local birds and you're gonna find the flock of chickadees because they know where the good food's at. So if you get a flock of chickadees in your yard, make sure to check and see if you have any other cool species of birds as well. So the next bird that I'm gonna talk about is this guy. Is anybody familiar with this one? So this bird is both very cute and very tough. He's one of the toughest birds out there. Um, and it's one of the most common species we have that many people don't know about. Um, this bird is, oops, this bird is called the tufted titmouse. So you can tell, they kind of look like mini blue jays to me. Um, so it's kind of got that longer tail, that little crest at the top, um, but they don't have that patterning that the blue jays have. They're, and they're more gray than blue in the back, uh, on their back. Have that white belly, and you can sometimes see this little rufous underneath the wing here. And then they have a beak very similar to that chickadee, 
and that little black patch above their beak. And this is what these guys sound like. So I think they kind of sound like they're going Peter, 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 Peter. So the tufted titmouse is always looking for Peter. That's how you can remember that song. Um, so a fun fact about these guys. So there are a lot of cool things about them, but one thing that I find particularly cool and kind of funny is that they like to line the inner part of their nest with animal hair. And they not only find this animal hair by looking on the ground or in trees and stuff like that, but they will also pluck it directly from the animal itself. So um, I don't know if this makes them brave or another word, but um, this is one, so this is the tufted titmouse here pulling the hair from the raccoon, which I think is kind of ironic in this picture because the raccoon is eating the bird seed. They also, there's also some videos you can find on YouTube of little tufted titmice pulling hair from dogs sleeping on porches. But the dogs don't seem to mind because the dogs never like really move. So the tufted titmouse must be kind of gentle when it does this, which I think is super interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's a fun fact about those guys. Um, so that concludes my birds that I'm gonna talk about. And I'll come back and talk to you guys a little bit more later about how to track birds to your yard. But right now I'm gonna hand it over to Zeb, who's gonna share some of his favorite birds. All right, thank you, Paige. I will be sharing mine here very shortly. All right, I think that's going now. Perfect, so you can see from this first picture here, the first one I'm going to talk about, right? Yeah, uh, is the American Goldfinch. And this photo here was taken by Stephen Johnson. He entered it into our photo contest, which we do every year. It was one of our top two pictures this year. Um, and you can see why, it's a very striking bird. It's a very pretty looking bird with a lot of color to it. So more about the goldfinch. Um, they have this black and yellow pattern. The males actually have kind of a black helmet or hairdo on the top here when they're in the breeding season, which is about this time of year. They eat lots of seeds. So you can see this one is kind of picking at a flower here. They'll eat lots of seeds. Um, even though they eat seeds, they sound like they're asking for potato chips. So as Paige was saying, we give these um, bird calls kind of a mnemonic is what it's technically called. It's where we come up with a name for what they're saying, and it just helps you remember what the birds sound like more. So I'm going to play you guys the um, goldfinch call. You'll see them flying around saying that, asking for potato chips all the time. So you can hear they're like, potato chip, potato chip, or potato chip. Um, so yeah, that's what they sound like. And then, as I mentioned, they eat lots of seeds. So I have, I have a pair that actually come in my backyard quite a bit at my feeder, or there's a couple of, couple different goldfinches around. Um, another fact about the goldfinch is it's my home state bird. Even though we're in Missouri and I live in Missouri now, it's not my home state. Um, and so Missouri has a different state bird. It might be worth a activity to do with your kids to look up what your state bird is. Most states have at least one state bird. Some states have two. And then there are up, some states share the same state bird. So it could be an interesting thing to look at which birds are the most common ones. And if your state bird is in another state as well. So the next bird I'm going to go to is the Northern Cardinal. Um, one reason these are one of my favorite birds is they are bright red, they're unmistakable. If you see one in your yard, you almost always know that it's a cardinal. And the really cool thing about cardinals too is that the female also has a lot of this red. It's not quite as dramatic as the, the male, but they have a red beak just as well um, and red on the wings. And then they have that same red crest to them. So they've got the same shape and then the same colors, not quite as bright of red, but they have a lot of the same colors. And like goldfinches, cardinals eat lots of seeds. So they will come to the same feeders as the goldfinches. Other cool facts about cardinals, um, they find mates and start their families for life. So a male and a female bird will stay together as long as they can. And then actually these, the, the male birds or the dads will feed the mom and babies when they're nesting. So they'll come over and they'll bring seeds or other food to the, the other birds in the nest. Um, pairs live together for life and they live together year round. So these are birds that you'll, you can see in your backyards during the winter still too. And they stick out quite a bit when there's snow and 
and mostly dead trees out there, you can see these bright red birds out in your yards. And then the last bird I'm going to cover is the northern flicker. Now this northern flicker looks a lot like a woodpecker, right? Well, it's because it is. It's not, it, even though it doesn't say woodpecker in its name, it is in the woodpecker family. You can tell it's got this really long beak. It looks like it'd be really useful for pecking at wood. And they've got these toes that are designed for climbing on, tr on trees. Um, unlike most woodpeckers, they are mostly brown um, with that um, white and black spots. And that's actually one identification factor you can use when you're seeing these birds is this white rump patch here really sticks out on these birds. And one reason you can see this a lot is these birds will actually hang out on the ground sometimes too. Um, one other identifying factor for the, the flicker though is that the males have a mustache. I mean, how cool is that? It's a bird with a mustache. That's great, right? Okay, so going back to the fact that you'll see this white rump patch, it's because uh, they use their long pointy be beaks or bills um, to, and, and so in, in their long pointy beaks, they also have a really long tongue. And instead of like most woodpeckers, they will use theirs to find ants on the ground. So they'll be on the ground hunting for an ant nest or something and then use their really long tongue to, to um, suck up ants that way. And so because of that, you'll see them on the ground and then you can see them flying up and climbing sideways on a tree. And with that, I will pass off the next set of birds to Dana. Thanks, Seb. Let's see here. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, may I get a show of hands if you recognize this particular bird? All right, we've got a few happening. Very good. Um, this next picture might help folks. Um, we don't often see them perched um, as often as we see this species flying. And I have to say I'm probably stretching the definition of backyard bird here a little bit. Um, even here in smallish towns such as Marshall where I live, um, these birds can be seen flying around town and flying in backyards. Um, the more urban you get, maybe the less likely you are to see these guys. They're definitely an open country flyer. This is the barn swallow. So I just personally find this bird to be incredibly cute and an incredibly acrobatic flyer. They do half barrel rolls in midair while they're cruising around. They also have really, really neat nests. Um, and I think that a lot of folks are familiar with this bird because of their nesting habits. They'll build these um, mud and grass nests on the sides of barns, go figure. Um, and also houses and porches, if you're lucky enough to have that. You can see from this picture that it's a species that um, the parent continues feeding the fledglings for a while after they do leave the nest. One really cool thing I think about this bird um, is that it has a worldwide distribution. So this is our barn swallow, the same one that we have here in Missouri um, during the, the spring, summer, and early fall during our bird breeding season. Um, you can see that in the orange on this map, um, but you can also see that they are um, across the entire globe, which I think is really neat. So if you ever travel really far, this is a species that you can see pretty much anywhere. My next favorite bird is one that a lot of people don't like at first. Um, and can I get a show of hands on this one? I got one, one hand I saw, if you know what this bird is. All right, got a few more, good deal, good deal. This is a turkey vulture. So I like this cartoon. I thought it was pretty funny. I am a turkey vulture, yes indeed. My head is bare to prevent rotting flesh from adhering to it because they eat carcasses, they are scavengers. To keep cool, I poop on my legs and feet. This is an absolutely true fact. My main defense is projectile vomiting, which if I were a predator of a turkey vulture, I, that would definitely keep me away. And they are pretty awesome. I mean, these are, most folks can, you know, humans consider this kind of a gross thing. 
um, these traits, but they're, they're really good survival and defense mechanisms. Um, I personally find the face of the turkey vulture to be very cute. Um, and another cool thing about them is they have a sense of smell, which makes sense, right? They basically fly around on the thermals um, and they are alerted to the food that they eat um, via smell. And most birds have basically no sense of smell. So one of the things that I love about turkey vultures is how very majestic and graceful they are in flight. Um, I hope everyone on this this webinar has seen them flying before if if you haven't when you do you'll know <laughs> um they're they're very very graceful they tend to ride thermals so updrafts of warm air without flapping their wings um so they're just gliding around but then sometimes you see them do this they sort of fold their wings back a little bit and then they can really cruise fast and far and have more control over their flight um, than when they're just riding the thermals. This is a picture um, that a friend of ours took, and these are juvenile turkey vultures, which is why their heads are not red yet. And you can see the ones playing with a stick. Um, turkey vultures actually have very complex social interactions, um, and they're very sociable. Um, in this case, these two juveniles were literally playing with this stick and kind of stealing it back and forth from one another. Finally, here's one. This is a backyard, backyard bird for sure. Um, can I get more hands? Who knows this guy? A few, yeah, all right. Very good. So you can see this bird is pictured on a feeder. This is one along with um, some of the birds that have been presented already by Paige and Zab. This is a very common backyard bird, the white-breasted nuthatch. Um, and this bird is unique for its movement going down trees, um, kind of the opposite of woodpeckers. So they can also kind of circle branches as they're foraging and go upside down. And something that they do that I think is both cute and funny and interesting to watch is when they are upset or, or territorial or being aggressive, trying to keep um, another bird out of their territory or maybe away from the, their, the feeder that they're feeding on, um, white-breasted nuthatches will do this thing, and I know this is a weird thing to do over a webinar, but they bring their wings up like the bird in this picture and they go beep, beep beep and I think it's really cute and I don't really think it scares off a whole heck of a lot of other birds um but that is their that is their aggressive posture and sometimes every now and again this bird is a little bit clumsy and something like this happens this bird was totally okay it just sort of fell into the snowbank while trying to get a peanut and I'm going to turn it over to Ethan who's just going to come over and sit where I am sitting uh, hi everybody. I'm trying to figure out how much time we have here, but uh, it just puts it. Okay, sir. Okay. There you go. So um, I thought I'd talk about a couple species of birds that I really love a lot because they just bring a lot of good joy with their songs. And there's so many birds out there to choose from. So these are just a couple. How many of you recognize these birds? I, I gave a little cheat there. It says wren. Got a few people that know them. This is, so they are in a wren group. Oh, there's a few more people I see. So um, these are two different species of wren that are really common. Um, and here in Missouri, we actually have the one on the right year round and the one on the left uh, just comes up during the summertime. But um, I well, thought I'd show you a couple ways to, um, to, to how to identify these birds and, and look it up for yourselves. Um, so I have a couple favorite field guides. Um, I really love Sibley's a lot. Sibley's is a great field guide. It's um, got family groups right in the in the beginning of uh, each listing. So birds are arranged by families in all these uh, really good field guides, and that's a great way to start out. 
Um, so for if you're birding as a family, you can actually bird ID by family. Um, so the image there on the left is actually taken from Sibley's Field Guide, the actual book, and the one on the right is from the app, uh, Sibley app. And so I thought I'd show you just sort of how the family groups are there. So if you know it's a wren, you're in good shape. You can go right to wrens, just like any other family. So we'll just look at these two. There's the Carolina wren. So that was one of them. And there's the house wren. So you can see there's other ones in the family. Uh, there's other wrens, a couple that you might see here in Missouri, but they're a lot less common to see in your backyard. So if you see a wren in your backyard, it's most likely one of these two. So let's take a closer look at this app and I'll show you how I found the birds in the app and maybe it'll be useful for you. Um, so in the Sibley's app, I just did a search for wrens right off the bat. So I typed it in there um, using, using this menu. Um, you can search by English names or if you're, or by scientific name. Um, I put the, my location is Missouri, so that helped sort of narrow it down so it doesn't pull up all the wrens. But I searched for house wren and boom, there it is. And it has all these great pictures for what wrens look like, house wrens look like across their range as well as range maps um, and has um, their audio uh, so you can hear what they sound like. So just a little snippet there for now. Um, you can click on the range maps and it shows them. And most importantly, you can go up to similar and do a comparison of these couple species here. And so here's house run, Carolina run, side by side, what they look like. You can really see some of the distinctive markings that make them unique visually, as well as compare their songs side by side and their descriptions and the descriptions of their sounds. So I find that really, really useful. Um, there's a lot of other bird apps out there, but I really like the comparison feature in apps, if, if like the Sibley's one. Um, uh, Peterson Field Guide, other field guides out there are really good, but I just sort of like that one. So let's take a little look further into comparing these two real quick. Look at that beauty. Okay, so this one on the left, there, there's our um, Carolina Wren. You can see that distinct uh, eye line really makes, a, uh, really makes it look, um, gives it a, its a distinctive look over the smaller um, and more drab a little house run, but as you can see, if you look closely at those house runs, they're actually quite ornate as well. And so um, you'll notice if you see these runs hop around in your yard, they both have the tails popped up and they often sort of twitch around quite a bit. Um, but, but looking at the big, long, sloping bill, that white eye line uh, really helps separate the two um, doing a comparison. There's a song we hear year round, and that is the sound of our Carolina wren. So it's saying tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, some people say. That's, that's in juxtaposition to the more liquidy sort of rambling song that you'll get out of, a, and the chattery song you'll get out of a house wren. Carolina run. The house run recording was actually from our our backyard here. Um, they they sound uh, pretty similar throughout their range, and, but they're very distinctive. Just like their appearance, their sounds are very distinctive. Another another thing you can uh, uh, recognize them by around your house in Missouri would be if you find their nests. Um, we actually have a Carolina wren nest right there on the left in one of our bluebird boxes, and they always build this dome. They build nests in your garages, in your greenhouses, and random things you might leave out on your porch and grills. Be careful firing up your grill first time in the springtime. Um, and, and so that's a very distinctive shape that they have, um, and so you know not to disturb those guys. And then the, on the right, you'll see um, the house wren, they just throw a bunch of sticks in there. They're not really the best house builders, but they sure do spend a lot of time jamming a lot of sticks in holes. And this house wren will go in and just fill any hole he can find up and then take his, his uh, wife on tour and let her sort of decide which house she wants. 
and uh, there's what looks like inside your like your typical bluebird box. You might find some house wrens nesting in there, and that's sort of what their nests look like. But that's all I have on these two wrens, and and uh, I guess we can we can move on to whoever's next here. This page. Paige can take over. Yep, thanks. Uh, if you want to stop sharing the screen so I can. <laughs> got it, got it. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys for sharing um, those of your favorite backyard birds. And thanks, Ethan, for going over um, some tips about field guides and field guide apps as well. And I'll share some resources at the end if um, you want more information about that. Because, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into that. <laughs> All right, so now you learned all about the cool birds you might see in your backyard. Let's talk about how to get them to your backyard. They're probably already there, um, but you can attract them in a several different ways um, so that you can more easily see them as well. So what you want to think about are you want to provide the things that birds need, um, that what makes a good habitat. So just like us, birds need food, water, and shelter. And some different ways that you can provide those different things are you can provide some bird feeders and we'll go over some that you can make in your own home. You can provide some water features and you can plant native plants. And I'll talk about each of those things in detail right now. So we'll start with bird feeders. So this is the most fun one because this is your chance to get crafty. So my main advice with um, putting up a, your own bird feeder is keep it simple. Um, birds aren't picky um, <laughs> as far as what they want to eat. So simply smearing some peanut butter on a tree trunk um, could um, attract certain birds um, to a certain area. Um, simply taking up toilet paper roll, putting some peanut butter on it, rolling it in bird seed, putting a string through it, hang that up in a tree, you've got yourself a bird feeder. Um, this person just took some wire cut up an orange, stuck that orange on a wire, and that'll attract certain birds that like to eat fruit. Um, this person took a jar, filled it with some peanut butter or suet or some sort of material, threw some seeds in there, put a string around the handle, hung it up in a tree, and look, that chickadee loves it. Um, so don't overthink it. If you have a container um, that you think you can recycle and make into a bird feeder, I say go for it, figure out a way. That can be really fun too to practice your engineering skills. Um, and there are lots of different resources and videos out there um, about different DIY bird feeders. Um, one great resource that I found is by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They have a web page, and I'll share that link at the end as well. Um, and they go over some of these different types of feeders you can make. So a pine cone feeder is probably the one that you're most familiar with, and maybe even one that you've already made yourself. Um, but if you're like me and you don't live in an area with a lot of pine trees, you don't really have a lot of pine cones either. But there, the good news is there's a lot of other options. Um, you can make something called bird seed cookies, which are essentially just like seed um, and some sort of like sticking agent that you can make and then hang up in a tree. Or you can make a bird feeder out of, out of almost any recycled container. <laughs> um, so one example um, in this picture here to the right, um, they, this classroom made feeders out of old yogurt containers. And so they just kind of cut a hole in the bottom, stuck some dowels through the end, tied a string up, up around it, and they can lift that lid and refill it. And there you go, you've got yourself a bird feeder. Um, that looks pretty, pretty good and probably was really fun to make. <laughs> um, so now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and show you guys some different feeders that I've made um, with different kids in my classroom or my camp. Um, and so, yeah, let's go. Ahead. So the first one um, that we made, so I kind of, it's kind of an adaptation of that toilet paper roll one. So it looks like this. So, and if you don't have toilet paper rolls around, or if you're like me and you didn't have enough toilet paper rolls, um, you can make your own toilet paper roll. And then I just took some cardboard, like from a cereal box, and cut it about the length of a toilet paper roll and stapled it together on one side. Oh, um, sorry. Something with my computer habit. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so you can make your own toilet paper roll. Then I just punched some holes on the top, stuck a string through it, and you can hang that on a tree. Then I poked some holes in the bottom and then found some twigs that I found in the backyard 
and you kind of put them a little bit off center and you stick them right through. And I recommend putting um, the peanut butter on and then rolling it in seed before you put the sticks through because um, that obviously makes it a little bit easier to roll it in the seed. Um, and then the sticks will stay in the um, cardboard a little bit easier as well. So that's one that's worked and birds have come to that. The only recommend, uh, recommendation I make if you're gonna use cardboard is that you bring it in before it rains because rain will um, make the cardboard really soft and it'll kind of fall apart. Another one that has worked for me, so this is an old yogurt cup and I simply glued some string to the sides of it, hung it up in a tree, put some seed in there, and the goldfinches loved it. So pretty simple, pretty easy. <laughs> now the one that my campers really wanted to make that's a little bit more complicated um, is a hummingbird feeder, um, but you can make this at home. So this is the one um, I found a video and I will share a bit the video link with you guys as well about how to make these. So all this is, is an old soda bottle, some wire, or you could use string, anything like that, tied around here and then looped on the top and an old Tupperware container. And so essentially what you do is you first cut a hole in the top of the cap, cut a hole in the lid of the Tupperware container for the bottle to go through and then some small holes where the hummingbird can access um, the sugar water. Um, or what I recommend using too, if you have, so I painted around the hole so the hummingbird can find those, but if you can find an old Tupperware container with a red lid, which is a color that attracts the hummingbirds, you're good to go. You don't even have to paint it. And then I have this old soda bottle. So you'd fill the soda bottle with the sugar water. You stick the lid over that, take the cap with the hole in it, screw that on, Put the Tupperware bottom onto the Tupperware container and hang it up like this and the nectar will drain from the bottle into the Tupperware container and the hummingbirds use it. They have no problem. <laughs> um, so it's worked really well and that's a pretty simple one. Um, so let's go back to the PowerPoint here. So those are some easy ones that I've done. Um, and like I said, you can keep it really simple and think of your own ones if you wish. So the main reason that birds, um, I think people have, people struggle with getting birds to their feeders is more about placement. It's really important about where you put your feeder. Um, not necessarily always what's in it, um, but where you put it. So some things to consider or keep in mind when you're thinking about where you wanna put your feeder, you wanna be able to see it well. So do you wanna watch your feeder from inside your house through a window? Do you wanna watch it from your porch? Um, or do you plan on kind of going somewhere in the backyard, maybe from like a fire pit or something that you wanna be able to see the feeder from? So you wanna be able to see it well. And then the, main, the other main thing for birds to get there is you wanna make sure that your feeder is in a safe location for those birds. And let me clarify what that means. So um, you wanna make sure that they're um, at least three feet or they're closer than three feet from a window or farther than 30 feet from a window. And this is because birds um, within that kind of distance dif differential, um, they might see a reflection in the window or they may not see the window and they may hit the window and that doesn't make it safe for those birds. Um, you also wanna make sure you place it close to a natural shelter. So either a tree or a shrub nearby, so underneath a tree or near a shrub, um, and that's really important. Um, some people will have feeders like way out um, in the middle of their yard and they're like, why aren't birds coming to my feeders? Well, they don't feel safe flying way out. That's kind of dangerous for them to fly out to your feeder um, if they don't have any natural shelter nearby to protect themselves if a predator were to come nearby or they feel threatened. Um, so, and you can provide this yourself too by just kind of taking some sticks um, and making a like loose brush pile um, near your feeders for those ground um, ground dwelling birds. A really important thing um, too that some people don't think about is if there are any outdoor cats in your neighborhood, either you have an outdoor cat or your neighbor has an outdoor cat that you can't keep from coming into your yard, we recommend that you don't put a feeder up. Um, this is because cats aren't natural predators to birds um, and they're a really big threat um, and the bird isn't safe if there's a predator nearby. Um, you're essentially creating that a bird buffet for that cat. 
Um, so we recommend if you have outdoor cats to not put up those bird feeders or bird, or bird nests. Um, and that applies to hummingbird feeders as well. So speaking of hummingbird feeders, and I got, and then like I, I think I said earlier too, we got a hummingbird today at the feeder, so they are coming back. Um, and so um, these are some more tips. Um, these are by no means requirements for putting up hummingbird feeders, but just some things that can save you some time and money. Um, so place, you wanna make sure you place feeders um, where they're protected from wind, just cause like if your feet, feet are swaying back and forth, you might lose some of that sugar solution out of it. Also, I mean, hummingbirds are pretty acrobatic, but if, the, if it's swaying in the wind all the time, that's gonna be kind of hard for that hummingbird to get at your feeder. Um, I think a bigger thing is you wanna try setting it in a place that's shaded um, for most of the day at least, um, because the sugar solution spoils more quickly in the sun. Um, if you can't find a shaded place, that's fine. It, what that means though, is that you're probably gonna have to clean that feeder more often. Um, and I recommend, even if you can find a place that's shaded most of the year in the dead of summer, I would recommend um, replacing that nectar every, at least every three days, um, just because it can spoil pretty quickly if it's in the sun or in the heat, the dead heat of summer. So my last and main advice to um, with feeders is be patient. Um, it can take a while for birds to find your feeders. Um, like I said, chickadees are really good at finding food and so are tip mice and they're likely the first ones you'll see at your feeders. Um, but that doesn't mean you might also get some goldfinches or some cardinals or something like that, but they will find it. Um, they're really good at finding food. <laughs> so just be patient um, and maybe consider maybe moving it closer to a shrub or something like that to start out. Another thing that you can provide in your yard that's a lot of fun is like a bird bath or a bird bubbler. And the main thing with these is just make sure you clean them quite often so that the water doesn't get too gross. Um, but this can be really simple and a great way to enjoy birds either drinking from the water or bathing in it. Um, and you can get really simple with it. So here I wanted to have a bird bath um, and I didn't have one like a fancy one like shown in these pictures. Um, so what I decided to do oops, is put, I found a shallow pie dish, um, filled it with some water and put it on top of a crate. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it works. And later that same day, birds were drinking from that water. So it can be really simple. You could fill a bowl with water and set it outside. And it's possible that birds or maybe some other visitors also might come and drink from your water. Um, and that's really fun to watch too. So the last thing. So this is probably, um, it's no by means last because it's not the most important because I think native planting Planting native plants can be both very rewarding and a really good way to attract the most variety of species to your yard. Um, so what we mean by native plants are plants that occurred in your area and that habitat before European settlement. Um, so plants that are really well adapted to that area. And there are a lot of other benefits, including low maintenance of those plants. Um, usually they come back year after year. And essentially the idea is native plants are co-evolved with those insects in your area. So the insects prefer the native plants and the birds need those insects. So almost all species of birds feed some insects to their young. So the best way to get birds to your yard is to have the insects in your yard, which the native plant, the insects need the native plants. Um, and so this can also be, this will probably be one of the thing that you'll, need to gather the most information on before you get started. But lucky for you, there's some really great resources, particularly here in Missouri, but you can find this information anywhere. So a good one to check out is Grow Native um, by the Missouri Prairie Foundation. Um, the Missouri Botanical Garden also has some great resources, as well as the Department of Conservation. Um, there's a lot of good information out there. Um, one thing that I'm gonna share with you guys right now is Audubon has a website, audubon.org slash native plants. And I think this is really cool. Um, so you go on their website and you put in your email and your zip code, you can click search. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna give me a list of all the different native plants that can be found in my area. And what I think is also really cool is it shows you what birds those native plants might attract. 
um, or what groups of birds. So say you're looking to attract a certain type of bird, you can go here. Oh, I just want to attract chickadees and titmice. <laughs> and here are the different plants that might attract those birds to my yard. You can also click here and add it to a plant list that they'll email you. So you can have a whole list of the different ones that you might want to have. And you can also click buy now. And I recommend going to the buy local because um, native plants are going to be even easier and more well adapted to um, the area, the closer to where they were grown. Um, so going local is really important too. And so you can go there and you can find where you can buy those plants. Now, ours may be a diff bit different due to the current environment, um, but they might provide some um, different ways for you to still get those plants. So I recommend checking that out. So I think that's a really great resource for you guys. And I'll share that website in the chat box um, as we're finishing up. Another place you can go to find these different websites that I'm talking about um, is our website. So if you go to mrbo.org and then you go to You Can Help Birds and click on Live Bird Friendly, it'll bring you to a page that has, of course, a bunch of different ways that you can be friendly to birds. Um, and it'll have those resources right here. So this is grownative.org's website and that one that I just showed you from Audubon. And, and then as well as a variety of other different ways that you can help birds, um, including if you have problems with window strikes, which I kind of mentioned earlier. The last thing that I really wanna share with you guys um, this is a really great resource, is if you go to our page and you go to education and outreach, um, there's this great page called resources for teachers and parental guardians. And if you click on that, what we have is a bunch of links to different websites that have another bunch of links and really great information and different, ac different activities you can do um, to get outside and explore nature more or they have um, links to different webcams of different bird nests that you can watch. And some of them aren't necessarily bird specific. Um, so if you wanted to explore more about insects in your yard or leaves or something like that, you can find those on those websites too. There's also some great information if you're considering buying some binoculars to enhance your bird watching experience. We have some information about which ones to choose. Um, we also have some information if you're looking, if you're wondering what kind of field guide you like, or if you're wanting what some of the best ones are for kids. And there also will be all the links of the different things that I talked about um, for bird feeders um, and how you can make those, as well as some nest box, res nest box resources <laughs> if you are interested in doing that. Um, and Speaking of nest boxes, we are gonna have a future webinar, I believe two, two three weeks, the second week in May, um, we're gonna have some nesting webinars and Zeb is gonna send out a follow-up email with you guys uh, that'll have um, the link to the recording of this webinar, as well as the links to register for those upcoming webinars. Um, so you'll be able to learn more about that. All right. So I think we're almost to three o'clock. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll take some questions, um, but we hope that you guys um, learned something about bird watching in your backyard and maybe you learned something about a bird you already knew, or you were like really inspired to go craft some new bird feeders and test them out in your own yard. So thank you guys all for joining us. We'll take some questions now too. Um, so if you have to leave at three, that's fine. Um, but yeah, we'll stick around. I saw a few extra hands raised there. Um, so I didn't know if those were folks that were responding to something or if there were maybe some questions, but go ahead and put any questions in that Q&A box. And I saw, see Zeb added some of the links. Thank you, Zeb, <laughs> um, to the chat box. And I'm gonna go ahead and add some of the other ones in there as well. <laughs> Oh, we got one question. 
I think Paige is answering that question in the chat box shortly. Okay. Uh, we had a question about the links to the, the Audubon Society native plants list. So if it's not in there, it's on our I website it. <laughs> or it's added right now. Perfect. And the link is pretty, um, it's not too hard to find just if you go to audubon.org and it's audubon.org slash native plants. So there's some Seth. things that are like really long and hard to like remember, but. <laughs> yeah, I think they've been sending me quite a few emails about that too. So they're happy to encourage people to plant native stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really cool resource if you're looking to plant native plants specifically to attract birds to your yard. <laughs> But Grow Native is really good if you're just looking to get information about native plants in general, for sure. And they do have a, Grow Native has a list too on their website that's like top 10 native plants to attract hummingbirds. So if you're looking to particularly attract hummingbirds, that's a really great resource. <laughs> and we're also fortunate in Missouri to have the Department of Conservation. They have regular publications of, of what what plants are flowering at the time. And they just had a recent list of a couple of the trees you might see that actually have flowers out right now, talking about more native plant stuff. So there's lots of resources out there. All right, everybody. Any, any more questions, comments? You know, feel free to put them in the Q&A box. Should I put rocks in my bird bath? Mm -hmm. um, that's a that's a good question. Are you guys, are Paige and Zab, and are, are you guys seeing that question? Yep. So I think that's a great question. Um, in my experience, it depends on the depth of your of your bird bath. Um, Store-bought bird baths are typically pretty shallow, right? You can just think of a normal shallow bowl of a bird bath. Um, and that is so birds can, I mean, if they wanted to, they could basically walk, even a fairly small bird can walk into the middle of that quite safely. Um, if you're making a homemade one and you have um, a lot of depth to it, then yes, I think it's a great idea to put rocks in it. Um, everyone saw the picture of Paige's homemade one, which is just a pie plate, right? So that's not very deep. Um, you wouldn't, you would want to give the birds a safe place to perch if they didn't want to go all the way in the water, which might happen with one that's, that's a lot deeper. So great question. Yeah, great question. I think the only thing I might add to that is, so, um, Rock, putting rocks on the bottom also helps them like see where the bottom of your bird bath is and that might make them feel more comfortable going and bathing in there. Um, but I also will say that part of the reason I chose a shallow dish and didn't want to put rocks in is cleaning those rocks is kind of a pain in the butt. <laughs> um, so just keep that in mind like it will require more maintenance and more cleaning. Um, so yeah, just something to consider. <laughs> but yeah, I recommend putting a bird bath out because it's really fun and really cute to see the guys like all bathing in there <laughs> or just drinking from it. And it didn't take the birds long to come to my pie dish. <laughs> and in either winter when everything's frozen or, you know, Everyone knows that in Missouri, we sometimes have very dry summers. Water can be a really, really important, helpful resource to have for birds. So it helps them a lot. Please give your recipe for hummingbird solution. Oh, um, you, you're the first one with the hummingbird this year, so. Yeah, well, so um, it's actually really simple. Um, and I think. The, some of the links on that resource page might have information about hummingbird solution, but essentially it's um, four parts water to one part sugar. So I'll put four cups of water um, and I boil it because I think it makes, you don't need to to like clean the water, um, but it makes it easier to um, stir in the sugar if it's, if it's really warm. Um, so four, and then I add a cup of sugar and then I fill up um, my hummingbird feeder. And then what I do is I'll put the extra um, in a jar or some sort of old plastic container that I've recycled in the fridge. And that helps keep it um, good 
for a, a longer um because i only get like one or two hummingbird feeder hummers at my feeder so they don't like go through it really fast um so yeah it's just four parts water to one part sugar and i believe i've recommend people have recommended to using um the like fine really fine sugar not using like some of the natural sugars that they have out there um and i forget why that is but there is a good reason <laughs> they're pretty hard to dissolve that too <laughs> large large grain sugar is it can be quite hard to dissolve so yep a lot of folks will spend a lot of money on store-bought red nectars and i've heard some unpleasant hypotheses about the red dye in them actually not being that good. Um, but what Paige just described is a, is a perfect and perfectly inexpensive way to make your hummingbird solution. It doesn't need to be this big expensive thing. As long as you have some sort of red or colorful feature on the feeder, you don't need red dye in the solution either. Any other questions? Those yeah, are good questions so far. Oh, yeah, they're great. Yeah, hummingbird feeders are great if you um, are someone who doesn't, yeah, doesn't necessarily want to spend a lot of money on a feeder, um, and you want to have decently low maintenance of that feeder because <laughs> clean it about every three days, or it's pretty simple. All right, everybody, if there are no more questions, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. And um, hopefully everyone found some things that they can enjoy around their house during this time and hopefully with, with their kids and, and families during this time. So thank you guys for attending and hopefully we'll see you on our next one. Same. Thank you guys so much for listening to me talk. <laughs>